Hello and welcome to the As Yet Unnamed podcast. I am Ian Barstow. In today's episode, we are joined by Canon ambassador and filmmaker and photographer Clive Booth. It's another really interesting conversation with Clive and we discuss his career, how he started, um, his work, his first big break, as well as his work on the RNLI and also some of the Canon equipment that he uses. So I hope you're going to enjoy this podcast. We will get to it very shortly, but first we're going to do the plugs. If you're listening to us on a podcast app, then please click on the subscribe and follow button. I'm releasing episodes every Monday morning and they will appear in your feed as if by magic if you click on subscribe or follow. If you're watching us on YouTube, you get the added bonus of some visual inserts as well. Fingers crossed on the video as well but if you are watching on youtube then why not click on subscribe like comment and share and all the usual bits right enough from me let's get on with the interview that we have today and i will hand over to myself to introduce mr clive Bruce. hope you enjoy the episode Hello, welcome to the As Yet Unnamed podcast. I am Ian Barstow. Thank you very much for downloading this episode of the show. And in today's show, we are joined by um, Canon ambassador and um, Adobe influencer and very, very good photographer, um, Mr. Clive Booth. Uh, good afternoon, Clive. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Ian. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. No problem. Thank you very much for, for coming on board. Um, so I first saw um, you, you came and did a presentation earlier on this year at uh, Roaster Camera Club. Um, yeah. And it was one of those um, presentations where just afterwards it was like, oh, wow. Because <laughs> it was, I think. <laughs> well, because they're gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get that a lot. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, no, it was just, it was such a, an inspiring talk that you, that you did for us. Um, at the camera club and i know everybody that was there was like that was one of the best we've had um well, that's very kind of you to say so i know i got a lovely email from you afterwards and uh it meant meant the world to me actually yeah it really yeah it, it, it was it was such such a good a good talk and um, so we'll, we'll come on to your your current sort of canon um ambassador and your, your photography that you're doing at the moment um but i wanted to start how did you was photography always something that you wanted to to do or was it something you came on to later in life i've always loved photography since the age of nine my auntie bought me a camera at the age of nine and uh it was a little 110 animex 110 and um i remember having a a real fascination with it and when it came to going to college i couldn't decide do i go do, do, do i study photography or do i study graphic design and i plumped for graphic design and in hindsight i'm really glad i did because i think graphic design is a fantastic um it's a fantastic foundation for creatives whatever whatever it is that you're going to do whether it's photography um filmmaking or or design in fact in fact to give you all my titles uh right now it's quite an eclectic mix um <laughs> i am a graphic designer and uh i am a photographer i'm also a filmmaker and i write a little bit I teach a little bit and of course i uh, speak for Canon as well on the ambassador program, but yeah, photography has always been, I've always been passionate about it and loved it. And it was, I think 20 years into being a graphic designer, I suddenly thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a go. And that was, uh, nearly 20 years ago now. So what was your, what did you say your first camera was? I presume it was a film. And a oh film yeah. Camera? I mean, it was one of those practically disposable. I <laughs> yeah. mean, it, it was, uh, a 110. I mean, the negative was teeny weeny. Um, but what it did was, which I think any camera does uh, for you, it, it it causes you to look through the viewfinder. Obviously, smartphones are different. You know, that's a, that that's another story. But I think it causes you to look through the viewfinder. And by looking through a viewfinder, you block out the rest of the world. And in my opinion, at least, I think you start to look at the world as a storyteller. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a, an important point, and it's one of the points we try and make when we 
the work that we do on the Cunningham People Programme for teaching photography and storytelling and filmmaking. What was your first sort of proper gig? So your, your first paid, paid photography assignment or unpaid photography assignment, but the first time you suddenly thought, blimey, this is a proper professional um, shoot that I'm doing and mm. I can't quite believe I'm here. When, when was that? Well, it was a, it, it, there were several things that happened to me as a photographer. First of all, as a designer, I was commissioning myself. And at the time, I, was, I had some great clients, Toyota being one of them. So I would occasionally commission myself as well as others. Um, so I would art direct shoots and had art directed shoots for many years. Uh, before that, though, going back into the oh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I had actually made films. So I'd worked for BBC. This is purely in my own time. So I'd spent two months in the Arctic, for example, making a film about an environmental research expedition uh, with the Arctic Research Group. That was very success the successful ex expedition. It won the Royal Geographical Society Expedition of the Year for 1990. Before that, I'd been up on the Old Man of Hoy working on a film. And then in 91, I went out to Switzerland and made a film on the Eiger. So I was doing a lot of adventure uh, photography and filmmaking. And this was in my spare time. And that kind of grew and it became a big part of my life. And so I became, a, from time to time, I would shoot in these extreme uh, locations and situations for uh, the BBC, including for Blue Peter. Uh, so that was uh, an amazing, exciting time for me, but all the time I continued to be a graphic designer. And then 2003, uh, I was going to Scotland. I have this long um, connection and association, affiliation, love affair, whatever you want to call it, with the Scottish island of Isla. I went there in 94 to make a film, and I've been going there ever since. And in 2003, I was part of a charity project, and we were going to row uh, an old Irish skiff boat around the island of Isla, picking up whiskies, because Isla uh, at the time, I think it was eight distilleries, now it's nine and growing. And we're going to pick up whiskey and then create a vatted malt and then auction that for charity. And uh, I was going to design the whiskey label, being, of course, the graphic designer. A friend of mine was going to shoot the pictures. Well, he broke his leg um, the week before on a bouncy castle, which left us in a very difficult position where we needed pictures. So uh, I hired cameras and went and shot it analog. And uh, I think it was that point where I really sort of got the bug back again and I really put myself in a, in a tough position I wanted to, to deliver I'm a perfectionist by nature and I think I thrive being outside of my comfort zone and that put me very much outside of my comfort zone but it was only really me that was putting myself outside of my comfort zone and um, and for two days I shot pictures uh, at sea on boats on lifeboats on skiff boats all kind of boats and portraits, reportage, all manner of stuff. And then I also designed the whiskey label afterwards. And at that really, at that point made me think, you know what, I can do this. And, and it was purely a matter of confidence. That was all it was. And uh, very quickly within a matter of a month bought a Canon 5D. And then a matter of two months, I'd got an 85 Prime. And then I got a 50, and then I got a 35, and then I got a 7200. And so I was investing in the equipment very quickly. Uh, so that was, that was the seminal moment. That was the moment in time where I decided this is what I want to do. But there was a bigger moment that happened to me several years later, actually, in, oh gosh, no, when was that? 2000, yeah, 2006. I was only three years later, so 2006. And at the time, I was working as a designer for Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, who is still a client now, um, but this time I'm uh, a photographer for them. And uh, I was working with Moet and Chandon on some very uh, luxurious sort of per point of purchase uh, design projects, including a taxi cab covered in Swarovski crystals, uh, all manner of things. Nice and, and, nice and subdued. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. But point of purchase for places like Harrods and Selfridges and stuff like that. So it was very cool 
you know, project work. And I was working directly uh, with um, Moet in the UK and also LVMH in uh, Paris as well. So it was, it was exciting project work, different. And I, at that time, I was still shooting and I would go along to parties uh, with Moet and Moet, the marketing team, had recognized my work and liked it. And the reason was because I was shooting an available light. So I was using my 5D and I was shooting with an 85 prime. And at the time, no one was doing that. And so I was getting these phenomenally atmospheric low light uh, repertage and portraiture um, uh, portfolios put together. Moet was loving it. And so they would invite me to the parties as long as I bought my camera and they'd give me a triple A pass. And so this then grew and then I was invited to one particular party that changed everything for me. And it was, um, it was at Somerset house in London and it was the 25th anniversary of the career of fashion photographer, Nick Knight. And, um, so I pitched up in my dinner jacket I had a 5D and an 85 Prime. That's all I took. And they gave me the AAA pass. And to give you an idea, Heston Blumenthal was serving ice cream. And you've got, I mean, you name it. Uh, you've got the fashion glitterati there. I remember the British Olympic fencing team was in one room and Heston was in another room. I went on actually to work with Heston years later um, uh, very closely. And uh, Mick Jagger and people like that and uh, Valentino, Alexander McQueen, Kate Moss. I mean, everyone was there. And I just uh, had this opportunity to take some pictures at this party. And so I did. And I think I had, I forget how big the uh, memory card was. It wasn't very big. It's probably four gigs by today's standards, which is tiny. And I shot about 500 frames in low light. And I have to be honest, at the time, I knew who Nick Knight was, but I didn't realize the importance of Nick Knight as a photographer and also Nick's reputation for spotting talent as well, which is done and continues to do so to this day. And the, I got back late that night to a friend of mine's house who I was staying with, and we did an edit of the pictures, sent them to Moet, didn't really think much more of it. It was exciting. It was a bell mask. So there were people in gimp suits and goodness knows what else. So, I mean, it was, uh, but it, as you can imagine it, with the Valentino hats and, and Stephen Jones, Millery and, you know, Valentino, all, all this kind of stuff. It's very, very cool. Um, and I came back to Ashbourne and the next day, I think I'd gone for a cup of coffee uh, down the road and I get a phone call and it was Nick Knight phoning me up and said, I've seen your work. I love it tell me about yourself and he said to me would you be interested in working with me and with show studio which is his online fashion magazine and i said yeah sure and uh, and that really began my career i think without that i don't really know I, I think i would have had a career but not certainly in the early days at least um within a matter of weeks and months i was shooting in new york for mac cosmetics and I was in um, Milan for Milan Fashion Week with D Squared, and I was, I, I mean, all, I mean, it, it was a dream, really. And, and that was primarily because of Nick and the opportunity he gave me. I then went on to be a set photographer. Um, I shot for Show Studio. He sent me off to London Fashion Week. Great thing about Nick was and is, he, you say to him, Nick, what do you want? He said, No, you, Clive, you just do your thing. You know, you, you, that's why I've asked you to do it. And so, he encourages, you know, your view, your look, and that's what he looks for in people. And, uh, and so I was his set photographer for many years and we've gone on to make films together and I've collaborated with him for show studio. I also became Miles Aldrich's set photographer. So I had a very um, interesting and amazing few years of, of working in uh, fashion at the highest possible level. And I learned so much through that and working with great photographers like, Nick and Miles and of course subsequently I've gone on as you know gone on to work with Sedon McCullen and many others so I've been very 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 fortunate to be influenced by such incredible talent. Did you have to pinch yourself when you first got that call and you had that first you were in New York for shooting all these sort of fashion world people and famous people did you sort of step back at one point and go 
blimey, how did I, how did I get here? And aren't I lucky to be involved in this? What I would imagine is probably a, a mad, mad, mad world sometimes of, uh, of fashion and, and the celebrity side of it. I still do. I mean, I still do. And I mean, I, you know, I came to this career quite late. I think uh, I was 40 when I changed careers, you know, to become a photographer. And then because of the advent of 5D Mark II, which is maybe something we should talk about a little later, uh, that then opened up a career as a filmmaker too uh, for me. Uh, but yeah, I, I still do every day. Um, every day uh, something new happens. And I think I'm just so lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, those early days for sure. You're in New York, you've got a studio on the harbour and you're there and you're shooting and you're thinking, how on earth did this happen? Where, where did this come from? And when you're making a film with fashion designers in London or you're, you know, you're on set even um, you know, with Nick or with Miles and you're witnessing you know, the world's, literally the world's best and you're sort of hanging out with them and you, you, you're watching the way they work. And then, of course, to go on and work with Sir Don McCullen and, and, and for Don, I mean, Don and I have become friends since, as I guess you might say with Nick, Nick and, and Miles. So I was only talking to Miles just last week. Um, so you, th there is an element of definitely pinching yourself. And um, I've always learned, and I learned this in my days as a designer, really, that the way to learn is to always be humble. Um, never be arrogant, ever. Um, I mean, you might be the most skilled person at something, but there's no, there's no room for it. There's no need for it. It's a waste of energy. So I would always ask and people would always answer. So if I had a question for Miles, he would always answer. And, and, the same, and, and likewise too, because at that time I was working in filmmaking and Miles was asking me questions and, and, and so was Nick. So there's very much an exchange of ideas. And, and certainly with Don, it's, it, I mean, it, you know, when you're hanging out with Don, I mean, he never stops. He's a machine. He's obsessed with light and, and subject. Uh, so, um, yeah, you, you, even to this day, I still pinch myself that I'm doing what I'm doing. And I always feel like, it, you know, the career could end tomorrow. I mean, because I think I came late to it. I've loved it. But I think being humble is very, very important because I think if you are and you're yourself, people are very eager to teach and share, um, you know, their knowledge. And I, I do the same. You know, I, I, I like to be transparent about what I do and, and share my knowledge. And certainly Nick Knight taught me that at an early stage because Nick is one of the world's greats at, at just sharing information and not hiding stuff and being incredibly transparent. I mean, in show studio, I mean, he was, he was doing stuff in show studio that a lot of people are not even doing now. And he was doing it in, in the sort of mid 2000s. So... It, yeah, it's incredible. And I think, you, you know, by working with people like that, you learn also that if you want to succeed, if you want to do something maybe a little bit different or, or possibly something that um, is going to be more fulfilling, then you've got to push yourself outside your comfort zone. I think that's a lot of thing I, I know from, I, I, I tend to stick with what I know. I, I find I've done a little bit of portrait stuff now, um, studio based, and I find that talking to a model that directing a model that asking a model to do something i still find that very awkward um because it's it's a very strange situation to be in that you're asking can you just lift your hand up ever so slightly and move your move your head just ever so slightly so i really struggle with that but i'm the little bits i've done i think help i just think it's the build the building of your confidence but it's okay. it's still a very it's, a, it's well, an awkward situation to be in sometimes. Well, you know what, you, Ian, you've touched on one of the fundamentals of people photography, basically, because um, the technique of using a camera is actually the, the really simple bit. Uh, that's the bit that, um, uh, you know, we can all learn the technique. And yep. uh, a good camera isn't going to make a good photographer. I mean, we all know that as well. Yeah. Um, so... The important thing is, and I say this to students, you know, learn your technique, learn it to the point where it's no different to riding a bike um, or walking or running. So you can pick the camera up, you know exactly what to do with the camera. So you don't have to think about the camera at all. It becomes an extension of your arm. Um, but the most difficult skill, I think, for a lot of people is to develop those interpersonal skills mm. 
And they, those skills are absolutely vital. I mean, it's the interpersonal skills that, that uh, can unlock the door to amazing work. Um, I think, I mean, my favorite story for myself is meeting Terence Stamp, the, the British uh, actor in a tea shop in London. And to cut a long story short, you can read it on my website, but to cut a long story short, I went up to him. I spoke with him. He left the tea shop. I chased him down Barrett's, Barrick Street. I managed to persuade him to come back the next day and sit for me for a portrait in the tea shop and then got him to go on to another location. A friend of mine who, a director friend, lives down on uh, Frith Street near Ronnie Scott's and sit for a portrait in an amazing sort of uh, location in window light. And that was all into personal skills. And it gave me one of the most amazing sets of pictures uh, I think I've ever shot. I can share them with you if you'd like to see them. Um, so that interpersonal, it's still one of the hardest things, you know, even to this day for me, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's breaking down those barriers, building that trust very, very quickly with someone and also getting them to invest in the process. That's really important. So it becomes a, a, a team effort. And I've had some great uh, experiences with that. I mean, one of my favorites was running through the streets of Cannes with Karen Gillan. And, um, the, you know, one minute I'm making a film in London and my agent, Mark George, finds me and says, you need to be in Cannes tomorrow. I was in London, needed to get back to Derbyshire, get all my kit together. Then I got on a plane, got to Cannes, and Karen arrived that night. We're all staying in this amazing villa. And then the next morning, you're running through the streets of Cannes, you know, with now, which, which is with now a Hollywood uh, star. You know, at that time, she just finished Doctor Who. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, it's, it's kind of daunting. You know, you, 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 you know what's Karen going to be like? How, and, uh, you know, you kind of think you've got an idea. And... And um, as it happens, she was everything you would imagine she would be, you know, very down to earth, a lot of fun, bubbly. And um, she pitched up with her own wardrobe and so on and so forth. We managed to get, I think we got, I um, uh, forget, some other actors, uh, makeup artist who I happen to know was out there. Bruce Willis, that was it. Um, she she was out there and she was doing Bruce and Edward Norton. And, and she said, oh, well, I'll nip up and do Karen's makeup for you, which was great. So we got some stuff at the villa as well. But um, that that's very much a team process. So, you know, I talked to Karen and said, look, what do you want? You know, because that's she's brand Karen Gillan, like um, most actors, uh, you know, a brand Terence Stamp or brand. I think in Terence Stamp's case, he, he's probably old enough where he just uh, left it to me, as mm. uh, some actors like to do with directors. It's in effect when you're working with somebody in a shoot, you are directing them. Uh, I mean, on the set of Downton Abbey was another good example where uh, several months had, uh, had, had gone by of organizing and planning with um, the Mail on Sunday's U magazine. It was, a, I think it still is, the largest um, uh, selling uh, magazine in, in the country. And they'd spent many months putting this magazine or, or getting uh, um, the permissions to go on the set. And uh, of course, lots of non disclosure agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So we get on the set, and within about an hour, they wrap. And um, I'm thinking, well, I haven't delivered. I mean, I got a few behind the scenes, which is what they were looking for. I went to the PR company and I said, look, you know, I'm not satisfied with, with what I've got here. And um, so there's a bit of pushing back. And this, is, this isn't just the non interpersonal skills. This is actually the need to want to, um, to achieve and want to get a result and want to come up because you know the likelihood is you're probably never going to be in that situation again. And you've got to look at every shoot like that. You know, I'm not going to be in camera with Karen Gillan again. You know, I'm not going to be uh, in Soho with Terence Stamp again. And so you've got to absolutely squeeze the most you can out of every opportunity. And so with Downton Abbey, uh, I managed to persuade the PR company to go back to the actors. And thankfully for me, several of them agreed to come and sit for me for portraits. I had just 10 minutes with each uh, actor. And um, we got some extraordinary portraits, uh, particularly Jessica Brown Finley uh, stood out in my mind because she, um, she, they were still in costume, which was great. And she was playing a nurse at the time. And she, I said to her, what was the last scene that you were in? And we're in Highclere Castle and it's made up as a hospital. It was serious too. And it was a hospital and she's 
dressed as a nurse and she said well I was comforting a dying soldier so I said okay great um can you take you know go into the position you were in so first of all we got that and I was with um my friend Billy who used to assist, assist me a lot Billy and I have gone on to shoot commercials together for people like Hackett and Aston Martin and Codirect um, Billy great one for light and all we did we just used a reflector many of those shoots it's all natural light and it was a it was window lit in high clear castle and it was an overcast day it was a sort of a a, a sunny day but overcast and um got these huge picture windows and we got the most extraordinary series of portraits out of the shoot some of the best I've ever shot in actual fact only 10 minutes with each of the actors but I remember Jessica going into character and I said, can you relive that last scene? And you know what? Within 30 seconds, she was crying. And so uh, I immediately said, right, can you stand here and let's get a portrait of her? And all the time, she's got tears welling in her eyes. And, um, and of course, then you've got the engagement. So I'm actually directing her like you would um, uh, a director. So um, this is where the interpersonal, I guess, exactly like you're saying, you can only really, there's part of you, some of us are naturally gifted in interpersonal communication, but I think um, to be able to do that, to walk into a room, to assess a room, look at the light, look at the backgrounds, look at the location, a lot of that skill for me comes from being a graphic designer and being an art director for many, many years. Uh, but then you're into your interpersonal skills. In non-photography situations, I'm quite open and easy to speak to people it, it is that when you're behind the camera and you're sticking a camera in the face and it's like that that i find hard i say it, it is practice i think it's it's mm. building that building your confidence to be confident enough to say to someone can you just do that for me i think that's 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 the skill that mm. that people need to learn when you're doing your your portrait and personal photography um so i will i want to talk to you about the um your rnli work because when i um when you came out, when you came to the camera club, the, the, the photographs of, of the, the lifeboats at sea and that whole series of work you, you did, the, the one where the, the boat is crashing through the waves, um, it's just, it's, it's one of the best photos I think I've seen. I absolutely love that photo. Um, so where did your, your, fascin your, your, your relationship with the lifeboat and the life crews develop? Because it seems to be one that's gone on for, a long time and is still something that you're extremely passionate about doing yeah absolutely i mean I, I can't believe it it's a quarter of a century actually since i first uh worked with the rnli uh on isla isla being uh and in the hebridean island just off the west coast of scotland uh three and a half thousand population isla's always been a place for me to relax and to um I guess it's kind of like it's become like a home from home for me and as I mentioned earlier I first went there in 94 making a film about sailing and whiskey and you take it from me there two things you definitely want to keep well apart <laughs> um, and it was then when I first met the um, the Isla R and Alive volunteers and at the time they had a Thames class lifeboat and I remember it was um it was a September day it was an afternoon we were shooting about I don't know five six o'clock so you can imagine it was a lovely day actually and there we are on the sound of Isla between Isla and Jura um and we were set up with the camera and the lifeboat was put on an exercise for us so we could we could film it and I remember the lifeboat approaching and the hair stood up on the back of my neck and it suddenly made me think if I was stricken in the water, say, worst case scenario that a boat had sunk, which does happen, you know, could be a fishing boat, or you'd fallen overboard, um, or you're in a yacht and you'd had an engine failure, it could be any number of things. Um, then this boat and these people who give up their time and, you know, at great risk to themselves, um, sacrifice this time uh, to go out and save the lives of complete strangers so it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck and a, a great personal sacrifice as well if you think that many of the volunteers have got young families mm. um, some are third fourth generation too and uh, 
that that never went away that this boat and these people could be you know the 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 only thing between you and your god basically so um it stuck with me and um i maintained a connection with them and then i'd been uh shooting a lot of films and directing commercials and and really enjoying it but it had got to quite a big level i remember uh, we were doing a commercial for intel uh, an asus and this is back in i think 2012 13 i was making a lot of films back then really enjoying it and it was getting to the point where i got 50 people on a set and and you're directing and for me that means directing the film and shooting and also shooting stills and there was a lot of pressure with that i mean don't get me wrong it was good it was enjoyable it was well paid and i would love to do more of it and uh, i wasn't going to walk away from it but i felt that i wanted to have a break from it and go back to photography and my wife and I were on Isla and it was I think it was October 13 and I suddenly thought wouldn't it be great to do a project about the people of Isla and the people of Isla are called Elix that's the indigenous name for someone who lives on Isla mm -hmm. and so if you live on Barra you're a Barras I think it's a Barrasca if you're on Collinsy you're a Collisca um, so everyone's got a, 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 an indigenous title, shall we say. And I thought, well, that would be an interesting project to do because I think if you have a personal project, it's, first of all, it's fundamentally important to have a first personal project. And I always have a personal project in the background of some form. Sometimes I have several. And much of my personal work, as in this case with my work on Isla, has turned into big commission work because agencies art directors, even clients look at that work and think that fits for my brand. And that's what happened with this uh, particular project, actually. And in 2013, I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to make uh, a series of pictures um, about the life, uh, you know, the day-to-day the, the -day lives of the, these island people, uh, landscape, seascape, flora, fauna, you know, what it's like to live on a Scottish island. So I put together a treatment like I do for most things, a, a written uh, treatment. I'd already shot lots of pictures over the, over the preceding sort of decade. And so I, I then went to Canon and for this, I went to Canon uh, print and they took a look and uh, Matthew Faulkner, who uh, is the guy who sort of had the confidence in me, who um supported me financially to go ahead and do that he and i have become friends and we're still friends to this day and he saw something in this and he recognized very quickly that i'd got this unique connection with these people in this place and that i would come back with something hopefully special and it never dawned on me at the time when i started doing this that it would grow into what it has done today and it's become films it's uh, and i'd like to do more with that but films made about myself on the island for uh, for canon and then for the rnli um the rnli part aspect of it 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 just happened naturally because i was photographing the people and i knew i couldn't tell this story about these islanders like people who were at sea fishing um the distilleries uh, farmers crofters you couldn't tell that story without talking about the rnli because the rnli on an island is hugely important and so it naturally progressed to uh, the uh, Isla RNLI and within the first shoot I think we clicked really well and the lifeboat operations manager uh, he whose name incidentally is Isla as well he and I became immediate friends he was a very keen photographer and still is and we, we're the greatest of friends to this day as is David um, the coxswain and then all the volunteers the crew uh, the, the people, uh, the, the land volunteers, everybody, we've all become a really, you know, really close um, bunch. And, and so whenever I do a shoot now on, on Isla, it's very much, I, you know, it's planned well in advance. We look for the right weather, the right light. Everybody's got a vested interest. And like most of my successful shoots, it's a, it's a team project. I remember you um, telling a story when, when you were out there that you were given one of the first canon eos by 5d 5ds it was five, yeah. 5ds yeah um one of only the one or two in the whole it was only country. yeah there was two in europe at the time and um and you took it on a lifeboat <laughs> I, I did i did i i think that the thing was what you have to remember is that i was working with uh canon europe uh print and this is large format print 
So my intention, and it still is an intention, uh, was to create a book and large format fine art prints. And I started the shoot with a 1DX, and then I was shooting with, I guess it would have been 5D3. Uh, it was a mixture, a mashup of, of cameras and lots of different lenses. But bear in mind, it's for print. Now, as you can imagine, my background's graphic design, so print is hugely important to me. I mean, here I'm surrounded by um, you know, large format printers. And so when you're shooting for print, you want the biggest possible capture file you can get. Yeah. And I'd been shooting, I think, I've done my first shoot there, and we got some amazing pictures. I mean, really wonderful pictures. And I came back. Now, in fact, I was still on Isla, and unbeknown to me, uh, Canon launched 5DS. Well, at the time I was a Canon Explorer, I, it hadn't been mentioned to me, so I wasn't aware of it. And of course, it had a, a over a 50 megapixel sensor, uh, which I think at the time, if you took a 16-bit uh, TIFF, was something like 300 megabytes. So you can imagine if you're making an A1 print, you want that camera. Yes. And it's still a great camera to this day. I mean, there are challenges in using it, uh, but once you know those, uh, you can get around that. So I, you know, anybody who wants to make you know, large format prints, it's still a great camera, the 5DS, the 5DSR. Um, and um, so I, I pitched the idea back to Canon, but in this, this time I went to Consumer Imaging Group and said, look, I've just shot this series of pictures. It's for Canon Europe for fine art, fine art print. And um, they loved the pictures. And I said, I want the 5DS. And this was on a Thursday, I think. And I said, if you can get that camera to me, I will get in my car and I will drive the 400 miles and I'll do the 12 hour journey door to door, including a two and a half hour ferry stop, go back out on the lifeboat, go back out on the, you know, on the um, fishing boats, do this, do that. And uh, I think the following Monday, the camera arrived all boxed on, on uh, a U UPS. And uh, it was only two. And they said, please be careful with it. It's, <laughs> it's one of only two in Europe. Uh, don't take it anywhere that it's going to get damaged. Try and keep it away from dust or water. So what do I do? I take it to sea on a lifeboat. Well, actually, not even on a lifeboat. I was on a rib, a rigid inflatable boat. So I'm like a foot off the water in huge swells and um, wind and, um, and we get drenched and the camera gets drenched, but the camera was fine. Um, I think we caught the bow wave of, of the lifeboat, which, uh, is a, is a seven class. So it's a 42 ton, uh, boat. So you can imagine that's quite a, a big displacement of water to go over your head, uh, and over your camera. Um, and I've since I've done the same with the 5d Mark four. In fact, just last year, I got that completely drenched in salt water, so much so that I, when I got back to the station, I just ran it under a tap. I mean, any camera retailer will 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 look at you in horror and say, you know, I've I've said this in talks before, and they say, please, 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 don't ever run your camera under a tap. But you know, I ran that camera under a tap, and it it's still here to this day. In fact, I've got it here now. You know, still there, still working. Um, you know, the the five D Mark IV, the you know, the one series cameras, they're really, really robust cameras. Um and um the, I've I've I mean I've never ever had uh, a camera fail on me actually. It's one of the biggest pluses of the cameras. Even the um EOS Cinema EOS cameras. Um a lot of people use Cinema EOS for filmmaking, particularly in documentary situations, because they're so reliable. And of course, wherever you go in the world, um, you can usually find an EF lens, some EF glass. That's the first half of the interview with uh, Clive. We will be back very shortly with the second half of the interview. Hello, welcome back to the As Yet Unnamed podcast. Uh, in this episode, we are joined by uh, Clive Booth, um, who we were discussing the RNI um, just before we, we had the quick break. Um, I'd like to get on to the, um, the camera side of it, because obviously you shoot Canon. Um, you are a, a Canon ambassador. Um, how do you feel the camera business is now? Because obviously everybody has a smartphone. Almost everybody has a smartphone. So everybody is thinking I can take photos uh, and I can do photography. And there's something like more photos now are taken every hour than have ever been taken before. Some stupid sort of stat like that. How do you see the business of proper 
proper in inverted quotes um cameras and and particularly the the canon side of it i know canon uh there's rumors they're taught they're releasing a professional mirrorless camera um and the the mirrorless is now the big thing to that everybody is going yeah and that's already announced now yeah we've got the r5 coming out which is an 8k oh they uh, yes they've done the um the pre-announcement with the specs haven't they because i remember um, i don't i don't yet know what the you know the raw file capability of it is but if you've got an 8k capture then that means that you're going to get some significant uh file sizes out of the uh, still side of it as well you wouldn't get much um, video on a four on a four gig memory card you were using in your five D, which no, be about, no, be about no, half wouldn't. a second. In Mind 8K. you, actually, interestingly, I mean, it's another aside, but um, you know, the codecs now are very interesting. You know, we have Cine Raw Light, which this one, the C two hundred, can capture in, which is really amazing. Um, you've got these H two six five and HEVC codecs, which uh, it, it, interestingly are being used for streaming four K HDR for Netflix and uh, Amazon and uh, people like Sky. So um, there's a lot of technology happening, and Canon are very much aware of that. And uh, you're starting to see that creep into the capture side as well. So whilst eight K might seem un- unachievable. Um, when you look at these new compression codecs, that it, it makes it doable, actually, believe it or not. I say because it's um, it, it it amazes me how how fast we have gone from. So I remember the first phone I had that had a camera and it had a six forty by four hundred resolution, and I'm mm. now um, I've got an iPhone eleven, and it's mm. it does four K in, in mm. it, it, beautiful looking four K. Mm. Um, in a small package like that, it's just the technology is moving so quick. Yeah, it is. I mean, if I could say a few things about this, um, first of all, let's take let's take the smartphone. So nothing wrong with shooting for, with a smartphone. I mean, a lot of people take some very very good pictures with smartphones. Over a trillion pictures are taken every year with smartphones. A trillion. That's now that for most human beings, that's actually impossible to even imagine. Yes. I can only give you my opinion of a smartphone and whether you share this or not, that's, that's really entirely up to yourself. But um, for me, and a gentleman gave me this great, great, uh, I guess it, an analogy, I guess it might be an analogy, a little story. So if I get my big camera and I get a smartphone, um, try and not get tangled up. Um, and this for me really resonated. He said to me, he held the two up and he said, with this, I take a note. And with this, I write a novel. And I thought that was a really, really great way to look at the difference between the yes. two. And if I could just add a little bit to that, I think for me, when you have a big camera in your hand, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be this. I mean, it could be, for example, you know, one of these. The difference between, let's take this, for example. The difference between this and even this is that it's got this, a viewfinder. Yep. Um, Now, the reason I mention that is that the minute you do this, you're blocking out the rest of the world. So for me, at least, I think you're becoming a storyteller when you start doing that. You're starting to block out the rest of the world. It's causing you to focus in a way that personally i don't focus with this with this i mostly take pictures of my cat i'll be honest with you and my nieces and nephews and um i'll take the odd shot because it's what i have with me um i try and carry this with me because i i do really uh love this it's a very powerful just for the um just for the the audio side only that's the canon this is the g5x um mark was it mark three or mark G5, I think it's the Mark II. It's the one with the, um, it's got a very beautiful OLED um, um, viewfinder in it. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, let's be honest, it's not a cheap camera, but gosh, it packs a massive punch for its size. It's over 20 megapixels, shoots raw. Um, It's got the most phenomenal OLED viewfinder, fits in your pocket. So very, very neat, shoots 4K video, very neat little uh, camera to carry around with you. but of course, if you look into, I mean, if, well, actually, I've shot some great stuff with these compacts uh, and made some big prints with those. I remember 
uh, shooting one from the water side for the RNLI. I was in an immersion suit and uh, put it in a waterproof case and got a great shot. But I think um, for me, this is about storytelling. This is, this is you, you know, you're blocking out the rest of the world. You're focused because you're thinking about um, the process of photography. And I, I'm the big believer in, in the big camera. And it depends on your definition of big camera. You know, it doesn't have to be big anymore. Uh, but certainly something for me, at least, where you have a viewfinder. Uh, but let, let's think about storytelling for a second, because we all hear the term storytelling. I mean, how many times now do you look uh, at people's titles and they say visual storyteller? What does that actually mean even? Um, and I do a lot of work with uh, the Canon Young People program. And, and also I'm on the advisory board for the Ideas Foundation in London, which is... Uh, uh, about teaching and helping young people and we we teach photography and we teach filmmaking but most of all we use photography and filmmaking uh, to help young people tell stories in combination with say adobe spark or indesign or or premiere pro um, or lightroom and it's very much putting those words and pictures together that mm -hmm. help tell the stories um, so as a storyteller using the camera for, you know, for, for the purpose of storytelling, which is most of our work. I mean, my R and L I work is very much about storytelling. Um, the work I've done recently with the Birmingham Royal Ballet, for example, is very much about storytelling. Um, but just coming back to that, why storytelling? Well, uh, the, the human brain uh, processes information in narrative form, not in bits of information. And so if we can think in terms of a narrative as a story, whether it be uh, a series of images or a film that actually tells a story, then other people are more likely to um, be able to understand it, possibly uh, depending on how you shoot it and how you tell that story, um, remember it. Um, and we only have, believe it or not, we only have, if you think of Instagram, for example, we have 1.7 seconds to grab someone's attention on Instagram. The average person scrolls through the height of Big Ben on their smartphone every day. I, I think if that. you've got a moving image, you're looking <laughs> at about four seconds. So Blimey. even on TV, you've only got six seconds to grab people's attention. So this is why in our work with the Canning Young People Program and the Ideas Foundation that, you know, when you're teaching young people photography and filmmaking, um and storytelling it, it's it's very much about finding something finding a story or telling a story in a way that's going to really grab people's attention and have a narrative and of course photography um you can have a single image narrative or you can have a series of images as a narrative do you still enjoy taking your doing photography for yourself so when you're you're not doing your project you're out on a walk and you're doing you're walking around some nice forest or hills or something. Do you still enjoy taking photography that's just for you rather than to, for a client or a commission? Is it something yeah. you still enjoy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I do. Yeah, definitely. And often um, in, in Derbyshire, uh, it's nice to get out for a walk and you take your camera. Um, I mean, it may be, I mean, I, I have a bike and I go out on my bike and I can actually fit the, I can fit this in, in my pocket so I can carry that with me and that will shoot a very, very nice file. Um, uh, so, and I get a lot of enjoyment from doing that, but I should say that my personal work is actually exactly what it says, personal work. So my personal project work is the work that's coming from the heart. I mean, it comes from the head, but it also comes from the heart and I encourage everyone to, to look around them, look at, uh, the opportunities, think about a subject that you've got access to that maybe others haven't. Mm -hmm. And you've got a connect, people you may have a connection with that others haven't and follow that and, and turn that into personal work because um, you can use that as a vehicle then to tell a story uh, about something that other people haven't done. And so I think the personal project becomes for me a lot of that, um, that time spent, like you might be going out for a walk. I mean, just in lockdown, for example, um, I've made a 23 minute film, like a documentary about myself. It's not been 
um, released yet. I don't know when it will get released. Uh, but uh, that's very much about my, I guess, to a degree, my views on photography, um, using quotes from different people. I mean, the famous Dorothea Lang quote, I think the ph photography teaches you how to see without a camera, which I, I firmly believe in. It, it does. I, I, mean? I, find, I find that when I'm, just when I'm walking around, and I'll suddenly see something. I think, oh, that's a. You almost frame it up in your in your mind. Uh, absolutely. Before how you many, even get the camera there. Yeah. How many thousands of pictures do you take a day? Yeah. You know, as your eyes as the shutters. Um, yes. And I think photography does that. And I, I think there's even an argument for saying that photography helps you be mindful. Mm. I think, um, you know, I look at the garden. I look at everything. I, I I'm com I'm all the time. I'm composing. I'm looking at light. I'm I'm composing framing um I, I i'm an obsessive and i mean particularly with light i mean i'm a light obsessive i never stop looking at light and i think that's that that's been with me i mean incidentally i mean this is a kind of a, i believe an interesting story but uh, when i was age nine i went to derby museum and i saw the work of 18th century painter joseph wright and his incredible uh, atmospheric um, candlelit pictures changed the way I looked at the world forever at the age of nine and and then subsequently I started to look at the work of Caravaggio and um, Vermeer and Rembrandt, Rembrandt and and even uh, Leonardo da Vinci and so my inspiration very much came from uh, these painters and and still now I look to those painters I mean I go out and work in uh, across a mirror um, for Canon, um, you know, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Asia, and and sometimes I can do. I mean, the last eighteen months I've done thirty separate uh, talks, so I travel quite a lot when we're allowed. Well, obviously before lockdown, and and in Malta particularly, I go always go to the Co Cathedral and go and look at the. And it's not a particularly nice subject, but the beheading of of John the Baptist, and look at the the way Caravaggio looked at light, and I draw lots and lots of inspiration from uh, famous painters i mean joseph wright not even that uh, i guess compared to his contemporaries had he been in london i think he would have been much more well known but i would encourage anybody to look at the work of joseph wright and look at uh, the work of caravaggio rembrandt because they've got this three-dimensional lighting with this half light and this light that's falling over the bridge of the nose and into the shadow area and uh, of the shadow side of the face and it, i find it incredibly inspiring to look at that and then to go back to my own work certainly portraiture and then look at recreating that and look at the connection you can make between you and the subject as well which is which is very very important i mean in portraiture for example you may in a single shoot you may come away with, for me you may come away with two pictures one if you're lucky one good shot yeah. most times you'll never get the picture that you want i mean you've got to accept that i i find now that i appreciate art more after doing taking up photography, I've been doing photography um, sort of seriously, taking my camera everywhere with me for probably about six or seven years. Mm. Um, and I appreciate more if I walk in or if I see a painting on TV or if I see a painting mm. anywhere, I appreciate that light. I see the light. I think I see it differently now to when I was not doing photography because it just makes you realize that I, I always think that some of these master painters, if they were around now, they'd probably be master photographers. Uh, uh, they just no, capture it perfectly. Yeah, no question, Ian. Absolutely no question in my mind that they would. And I think, you know, let, let's look at it this way. You know, if you're a writer, you know, you use one of these, you know, you use a, you use a pen, you know, that's your enabler. If you're a, I'm very fortunate to work with some amazing dancers and ballerinas. Um, and, you know, they use their bodies. Um, I think uh, if you're a photographer, you use your camera and the camera is purely an enabler. It just enables you to tell your story. Um, so a camera in itself will not do that for you. It's an enabler. So uh, I'm fortunate to work with Canon because they enable me to make films, to shoot stills and to uh, make prints. Um, but um, yeah, definitely. It, it, uh, and I think, I think looking at uh, light, uh, they, in essence, you know, once you've got your subject and your location, but your location can be driven a little bit by light. Um, light is what brings atmosphere. And, and, you know, as we all know, I mean, if you walk into a sports store like JD Sport, it's lit with fluorescent light and it's got no atmosphere whatsoever. 
Uh, whereas if you go into a low lit room that's just got lamps in different places, you've got pools of light. So you've got lots of atmosphere. So, um, I mean, if you want some examples or some great movies to watch, for example, um, look at, you don't need to look further than Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. And look at, for example, Barry Lyndon. And there's the amazing story of Barry Lyndon and how Kubrick managed to get the lenses, the Carl Zeiss lenses that were used by NASA uh, to photograph the moon. And uh, these lenses were 0.7 uh, aperture. And he was then able to get those lenses to fit on a Mitchell's, and, uh, no, a Mitchell's camera. And they were then able to shoot in candlelight. And he had triple wick candles to do the candlelit scenes. Um, with a depth of field of 0.7. I mean, a challenge in its own right, but he managed to overcome that challenge and create, at the time, in 1974, something that had never been seen before. And for many, many years, wasn't seen again. Of course, now we take it for granted. We can shoot, with digital particularly, we can shoot in incredibly low low light. I mean, the EOS R, for example, um, can shoot practically in the dark. And the R5 will be the same. Uh, but Kubrick was doing this, you know, with film cameras back in 74. Um, and uh, I, I find that stories like that and looking at the way film directors manage light. I remember seeing a, a clip recently, another Kubrick film, The Shining, and I saw the DOP uh, filming Jack Nicholson as he was crashing, you know, putting the axe against the door. Yeah. And it was lit with a light bulb. He was underneath uh, um, uh, Nicholson with a light bulb. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you can have, like I've got here, I've got, you know, quite sophisticated um, LED, bicolor LED lights, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, you know, it could be just as easily a light bulb or it could even be a pen light um, or a window light. But becoming a light obsessive, I think, is a very important part of becoming a photographer or a filmmaker because you use light to tell a story sometimes direct light can give you a very honest sometimes scary feel warm light cold light uh, direction of light um, you might see a scene in a movie where someone's needs menace so you'll light from above so you'll create dark shadows in the eyes so directors cottoned onto this really quickly and use light you know both directors and cinematographers use light in, in very creative ways and i often look to directors like stanley kubrick for my influences and my um my passion from light comes from both him and also from uh the other photographers that that i've worked with over the years i'm just trying to imagine what it would be like to shoot a photograph with a 0.7 aperture lens <laughs> and how big well, that lens must be well, well canon actually canon um did actually make for a time they made a 1.0 50 mil and and they're 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 very very rare and actually to buy one now is several thousand pounds and i think to make a lens like that you would get you get many many lenses that don't work to get the one that does yeah um and i, I guess the same would have been the ones that were made for nasa i think um, nikon have released a 0.85 lens yeah and like a the... like a two have got uh their, their sort of uh very low light lenses i mean one of the clever things that um uh, we have now as a brand in Canon, uh, particularly with mirrorless, with EOS R, um, you have to think of, of EOS R as a system. It's, it, it's, it's, don't think of EOS R as a camera. Think of it as a system because, of course, we've got, now got new mirrorless coming along like R5. And the R5, I think, will really start to fulfill the potential of Canon's uh, direction into mirrorless. And we have the most amazing lenses I've ever used, the RF lenses. And they are, without doubt, the, the best glass I've ever, ever touched. Um, and in fact, the RF 50mm and the EOS R is the best camera lens combination I've ever used in my entire career. The best Canon um, camera lens combination because what's happened is they, they've, they've, they've shortened the flange distance. So it's halved uh, because you've got rid of the mirror mechanism. So you've got about 20mm, not 40 or thereabouts. And of course, um, the glass is nearer to the sensor and they've changed the, the mount. So they've, they've, they've optimized the, the, the width of the mount to create uh, the best sort of, I guess you might, the, the way I see it is they've created, for me at least, um, the, the best type of lens you could possibly imagine. And so we, we now have, in fact, I'm talking to you through it right now, the RF50 1.2. 
and that's that's the best 50 mil i've ever used because it's 1.2 but whatever sits in the focal plane is in focus whether it's in the top right hand corner or the bottom left hand corner mm. it's all in focus there's no cr chromatic aber aberration um it, it's beautifully sharp um and the bokeh is is gorgeous and of course now we've got two types of 85 we've got primes that are acti actually acting like uh, sorry we've got zooms that are acting like primes so I'm very excited. Um, I'm more excited about the new R5 than I've been about a camera for years because I don't tend not to get super excited about cameras. But I think the R5 is going to be a little bit like the 5D Mark II was when that camera actually launched my uh, career properly as a filmmaker. Because that was really the, 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 Mark, the 5D Mark II was probably the first camera and video camera yeah that did everything that, that someone would need to make to take really good photos but also take really good video yeah um and that hybrid system because obviously i can see in the background you've got the um that's a c200 c200, C200, C200 so that, that's yeah. that's the the film camera isn't it mm, it's their mm. the no, one film off cameras. yeah we have we have uh several uh but yeah this is one off yeah. but that combination of one way you can go to anyone can pick it up they can take a a, a really nice photo but they can also do really good video I think that's something that's it just changed the market, didn't it? Back in it when totally. That was I mean, at, at the time I was shooting for, I mean, I was still shooting for Nick Knight, but at the, that time I'd got my own clients as a result of working with Nick. And at the time I was doing a lot of work with Mac Cosmetics. Well, Mac Cosmetics, a very, very progressive uh, makeup brand and um, very experimental. Uh, I, and this is another really important point that I decided that. I wanted to get back into filmmaking as a result of 5D Mark II. And uh, a guy called Vincent Laferre had made a film called, I think it was Reverie in America, a very well-known um, photographer and filmmaker. And it was hugely successful. And, it, and the 5D Mark II changed filmmaking forever because up until that point, to achieve the same results, you would need to spend in excess of £100,000 or more and the 5D Mark II came along and all of a sudden for a few thousand, less than probably five or probably less than four, you could do the same, the same thing. And so what I did was I found a personal project very quickly and I teamed up with fashion designer Roxandra Lynchich and I filmed one of her shows in the fabulous Raphael Gallery in uh, the V&A in London. And it was massively packed full of atmosphere. Again, it was all about the light. And um, I used, I think I'm, I used the one or two 5D Mark IIs. I can't remember because I think Canon supported me a little bit in that. I think, no, I think I had one. It was a pre-production. Again, it was a pre-production. I've had many pre-productions and I've had many firsts, actually. I'm very lucky with Canon that I've had that. And it was, I think it was amongst the very first films shot in Europe on that camera. And of course, I had a great subject matter. And then I created another film for London Fashion Week and another film. And my clients then started to see these films and immediately commissioned me to shoot commercials for them. It was literally, they saw what I'd done and said, right, we want you to do this. And the next thing I'm finding myself in New York at Milan and, and doing the same thing, uh, but for commercials. So Canon have got the new R5. Mm announced later on this year are we i couldn't tell you the um the, uh, the details of have you had a look it, yet <laughs> i've not no i think you know I, I would love to um but i think you know the you know covid 19 has obviously had an impact on everything and um so how's that affected your i presume you're not you're not doing the you're not doing any studio based work at the minute because we're not allowed to go out into the studio so how has covid affected affected well, you do you know what it's a really good question ian um there is no one more surprised than me in what the lockdown has, um, the effect the lockdown's had upon me. Now, let's be clear. Let's put aside the horrors of COVID-19. Like, first of all, you know, I have an elderly mum who is in a high risk category, as is uh, my sister. And of course, my wife's got an elderly parent, uh, elderly mother as well. And so putting aside the horrors of the lockdown, and everything else i never thought that lockdown would mean me me learning new skills uh working in an entirely new way a different way uh making a film entirely by myself and that means uh, shooting shooting in 4k um sound um edit particularly the edit editing a film in premiere pro because 
bear in mind when I ever make a film, I mean, most times these days I even have a, you know, I'm director and I have a cinematographer and I have an editor and I have sound people and um, colorists. And to do that entirely by myself was, it was one of the most liberating, exciting, stimulating things I've done for years. And now I'm not saying I won't come out of lockdown and not still work with my editor and cinematographers and everyone else, but it has taught me that I can make a film by myself. And that's been wonderful. And now I will go into filmmaking thinking differently and I'll, you'll probably see more films coming out of me, certainly more personal work coming out of me uh, because of that. The other thing that lockdown has caused me to do, uh, as my role in my role as a Canon ambassador, there are several aspects of that work uh, where I need to be in front of people, very much like the way that you and I first met Ian at, at the Camera Club. Yeah. And in the last uh, eighteen months, I've done uh, uh, I think I've done thirty separate uh, engagements in in the UK and abroad. So. Um, EMEA, um, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. Uh, and I knew that I needed to work on a way of being able to still talk to an audience, but do it from right here at home in the way that we're talking now. But I needed to be able to work out a system of which I could not only do what we're doing now, where I'm talking to you through a camera, but also have invited guests. But most importantly, because I'm a filmmaker and also even with my still shoots there behind the scenes footage, I needed to be able to share video. So in effect, what I've done is created uh, a home TV studio, really. I mean, there's no other way of looking at it. It's, uh, I'm using a, a live broadcast uh, delivery system to broadcast to audiences, which includes me talking to camera, it includes title graphics, picture in picture. I can invite guests. I can share PowerPoint slides. And most importantly, I can share video. And so for the last two months, I've been perfecting and working on that for Canon part as my role, for part of my role as an ambassador. So I've been uh, talking with other countries like Georgia, for example. Um, we've been talking about Visa Paul Homage, my work with Saddam McCullen in India. That's for uh, universities in the UK. I've also been working with the Ideas Foundation Charity and Canon Young People Programme with UK teachers developing um, education modules, uh, all using this new um, uh, broadcast uh, system. So it's it's been a phenomenally busy time. In fact, I've been really surprisingly busy i mean making my film there were some times where i'd be editing at 3 a.m go to bed for three hours get up and stop stop back at six get in the light in the morning get in the light in the afternoon um so uh, you know it, it's been a an amazing time actually i think we've um i think everybody has suddenly come to appreciate how much we can do online i can't wait to get back to actually being in front of people and and mm. the the physically sort of seeing people rather than it all being virtual, but it is amazing what we can do. And I think if this had happened 20 years ago, we yeah. would probably be in a, I'm not talking about the, the, the actual impact of the condition of the disease, but we would be in lockdown would be worse for a lot more people. Cause you I just from a don't business have the point of view. Yeah. 20 years yeah. ago, all you would have had would have been email yeah. really. I mean, I mean, I remember 20 years ago as a graphic designer, I mean, we thought we were great if we were sending a 20 meg file, you know, um, a 20 meg PDF uh, would, would take like overnight. And of course now, um, you know, I'm firing terabytes of data, you know, off or here, there and everywhere. Uh, learning how to work remotely is really uh, important, not just now. I mean, when we made the 20 minute documentary about Saddam McCullen in Calcutta, for example, in 2017, we already had a remote workflow. So my editor, for example, was in Soho. I was up here in Derbyshire. And through the wonders of um, what is called the Adobe Team Project, and we, which you can, it's still available today, we made the very first uh, uh, documentary short using that particular software. And what that meant was that Tristram, my editor, had the assets on a drive next to his computer. I had them next to mine. And through the, uh, the powers of Premiere Pro, we were able to make cuts and edits uh, remotely. And, and that's actually, a, a, that became part of my workflow three years ago. Um, you can even actually grade um, using, I mean, I use an ISO monitor here, 
And as long as that monitor's uh, calibrated in the same way as um, a colorist who might be in London or wherever in the world, um, then it's possible to do visual effects, to do to work on color. In fact, if there are Star Wars fans out there right now, uh, Mandalorian season two, for example, I happen, you know, I've been reading, I'm quite amazed by that series. I, I've only just watched it. I loved every second of it and fascinating to read the uh, interviews with the directors. But I think a lot of that series two uh, has been uh, done remotely. So the visual effects have been done remotely. I guess the, the you know, the colorists have been working remotely. So uh, photography, a lot easier, of course, than filmmaking because you're not working, you know, with the big, with the big files that you are in filmmaking. Um, but I think the way we adapt to change is really important. And I, I, I actually think that the lockdown, um, putting aside the horrors of, of which we're all very much aware, the, you, the, there are different ways of approaching a lockdown, but I think for many, it's caused us to rethink, to reevaluate, to learn new skills. And I know for a fact that the world will never be the same for me again after this, because I think what we're doing right now will continue. Yeah. And I think, yes, we'll still get in front of people, no doubt. And I'll still travel, but I think there'll be more of this. And certainly with the broadcast system that I've been working on, it's completely unique. And uh, I'm confident that, you know, we'll be able to do more and more of that. Uh, Clive, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, can you, um, obviously, you've got your websites and your social media. Do you want to um, give us uh, the details? Yeah, social media, it's all uh, uh, at Clive Booth Photo. So that's um, Twitter, that's Instagram, uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn, if people want to connect up on that too. Uh, my website is clivebooth.com. And it works on a post basis. Um, I mean, very viewable from a uh, smartphone as well. And there are lots and lots and lots of posts on there and stories. Uh, some of those stories go back a long way. So if you want to read about Terence Stamp, for example, meeting him, that's quite a funny story that's in there. The RNLI stories are in there. Um, a recent shoot with Apollo astronaut Al Warden is in there and what that meant to me. Um, so, yeah, please uh, do uh, have a look at my website. And and get in touch on social media. I mean, direct message me. Always interested to uh, hear what people have got to say and share stories and ideas. Um, and that's how, uh, basically, how uh, Ian and I met. You know, by coming to the camera club and um, we got chatting. And that's why we're here now. And I think it's important to share. You know, for all of us, we we learn from each other and continue to do so. And so we should. Thank you. Um, so, Clive, thank you so much for joining me today on the As Yet Unnamed podcast. Clive Booth, thank you very much. And there we go. Another episode of the As Yet Unnamed podcast done. Thank you so much for listening and thank you very much to Clive Booth for joining us on today's show. I hope you found that really interesting and inspiring as well. I know I did. If you want to find out more about Clive's work, then you can go to his website, which is cliveboothe.com, and you can find him on all the usual social media sites. Just search for his name and Clive Booth. So thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Don't forget to give us a follow and a subscription if you're listening on your podcast app. And if you're watching on YouTube, do the same as well. You know it makes sense. We'll have another episode of the As Yet Unnamed podcast coming to you on Monday morning at around 6am. So until next week, thank you for listening. Hope you've enjoyed the show. I am Ian Barstow and bye for now.